By the mid-1960s, the superheroes Jack Kirby had worked for three decades to define were finally thriving at Marvel Comics. But the creative energies which pushed Kirby would not stand still in success. As his work grew more self-actualized, it began to chafe at the demands of commerce and genre. The success of 1966's Galactus trilogy galvanized Kirby's ambitions. His long run on Thor had repurposed myths distant and removed, but Galactus and his herald the Silver Surfer opened Kirby's eyes to the potential of creating gods of his own. By most accounts, Stan Lee seemed to pick up what Kirby was putting down, but argued that a new title full of uncut Kirby mythology would melt more brains than opening the Ark of the Covenant. Any new pantheon would have to be soft launched into existing series like Thor, a character whom Lee argued should remain unchanged. This grated at Kirby. Most of the Marvel Universe began at Jack's drafting board, telling the story as he saw fit, with art and notes in the margins for Stan to reinterpret. How could Stan or anyone have the audacity to ask him to rein in the creative ambition that built the House of Ideas? Stan's reason, of course, was business, specifically that of an in-production Thor cartoon, one that it turns out offered Kirby no input, consent, or royalty. And if that insult wasn't bad enough, injury soon followed, and Lee and artist John Buscema's Silver Surfer No. 1, which cut Kirby's plans for one of his most personal characters off at the knees. Burned for the last time, Kirby slowly withdrew, until such time as he could find greener pastures. He'd keep his good ideas to and for himself. But by 1968, that was a moot point, as Stan Lee's uncle, Martin Goodman, sold Marvel to the so evil sounding you couldn't make it up, Perfect Film and Chemical Corporation. Believing he was every bit the solitary genius they'd read about, Stan was promoted, while a curt phone call offered Kirby a take it or leave it deal. Jack hung up the phone and called DC Comics' new art director, Carmine Infantino. Ragnarok had finally arrived. It is unclear whether DC Comics acquired Jack Kirby for the merit of his work or as a strategy to weaken their rivals at Marvel. But for Kirby, this was no rebound love affair. As artist, editor, and writer, Kirby would at last voice his own work, an entire line of it, on which he was eager to experiment with new publishing formats, new genres, and most vitally, stories that could challenge the perpetual tidiness of the superhero status quo. Yet for all the stars in his eyes, Kirby knew his new bosses wanted his boots firmly on the ground. He decided his first job would be the only existing DC title that wouldn't steal anyone else's. With its cloning labs and tiny monster movie worshipping planets and Don Rickles cameos, Kirby's Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen would plant the odd, inventive, and experimental seeds of his new gods. But Superman's inclusion meant oversight. The faces redrawn to match the corporate model were the first of many frustrating bureaucratic paper cuts. Still, with three more interwoven bi-monthly titles to add to his fourth world saga, he didn't have time to bleed. In The Forever People, Kirby saw the new teen gods he'd envisioned to replace the pantheon of Thor find new life. In Mr. Miracle, he channeled his feelings of confinement to the comics industry through an exiled new god royal turned escape artist, and his love for his wife Roz through the inconquerable Big Barda. But perhaps most importantly, there was new gods, with this Ragnarok finally realized, Kirby consolidated, entangled, and re-envisioned the very nature of good and evil. Raised in the paradise of New Genesis as the greatest weapon of a peaceful society, his Orion is the secret son of great and terrible Darkseid, a haunted outcast forced to hide his true face in nature, a soldier whose capacity for war is both a grim burden and a violent thrill. If Captain America was how Kirby prepared for war, Orion was how he intended to reckon with it. Unshackled, uncut, direct from the source, Kirby delivered an abstracted, operatic visual and written language, designed to somehow both distill and transcend reality, the cosmic Kirby enthusiasm to the Fantastic Four's Seinfeld. For some, the fourth world is almost too imaginative, too inventive, and as Kirby would soon find out, too ambitious. For the more than 100 issues under Jack Kirby and Stan Lee, the Fantastic Four had a reassuring tone and consistency that guided and connected with its audience. But upon moving to DC Comics, Kirby was eager to shake things up, to finally fill his own dialogue balloons, and more than anything, to escape the doom he saw lurking for comics as usual. Kirby hoped his collected New Gods saga 
would help pave the way for singular volume comics, for stories that were allowed to grow, change, and end. But critically, initially, his effort was met with mixed reactions, bearing no more relation to everyday conversation than his mind-bending design sense. Kirby's emotional, operatic dialogue spoke directly to many, but those who expected a Marvel comic under a different publishing banner seemed lost, befuddled by the cosmic game of Wordle presented to them each month. Perhaps to appease them, the editorial micro-incursions were mounting, as with each issue, what was expected arm wrestled with what could be. A major blow to the latter came when Kirby's plans to hand off art chores to a hand-picked staff fell apart. As more work fell on Kirby's shoulders, so too did the growing sense that he was stuck in the middle of crafting a novel he wasn't allowed to finish. Rather than let the audience build organically, DC's outsized expectations had caused them to push print runs as high as their top-selling title, Superman, a move further complicated when surging print costs spurred DC to raise prices to 25 cents. That full hard-earned blood nickel more than Marvel's cover price hit Kirby's four interconnected titles hardest, so when DC's bean counters blamed the losses on the complexity of the series, the writing was on the wall. In 1972, Forever People and the New Gods were cancelled. The more isolated and superheroic Mr. Miracle survived until 1974. But despite its premature death, the impact of Kirby's New Gods reverberated throughout late 20th century pop culture. And though both would soon return separately, those of you following this story closely can probably already guess that it ain't over, even when it's over. Following the cancellation of New Gods, a disappointed but undiluted Jack Kirby did his best to keep DC Comics a happy home. But ultimately, even creations like The Demon, Commandi, and Omak weren't enough to keep him from sleeping on the couch. After a 1975 rebound affair with Marvel fizzled, Kirby turned his attention toward the flowers and cash in animation, leaving many to wonder if the King of Comics had advocated his throne. The answer came in 1981 as Captain Victory and the the Galactic Rangers, the last chapter of a 30-year triple company Star Gods trilogy in which the names and shapes of the gods may change, but the authorial intent remains constant as the series' final issues reveal the captain as the grandson of the evil disembodied shadow Black Mass, a ghost of Darkseid now haunting the pages of Pacific Comics. But of course this ultimate fate of his new gods was all just suggestion, until it wasn't. Now free of the two-publisher system, Kirby had grown less political and more vocal about the disappointment and exploitation in comics. So perhaps as a result of all that barking, DC reapproached him with a chew toy, an offer to redesign his fourth world characters for the new Superpowers toy line, reprints of his comics to accompany it, and the chance to at last finish his novel. Kirby, however, was now 68 years old. The promise and excitement he'd felt 15 years ago was much harder to grasp. So when his initial proposal for Orion and Darkseid to meet a mutually destructive end in battle was shot down, and Compromise after compromise led the project to expand and warp out of shape and control. Kirby did what he always did, got personal. The penultimate, even gods must die, and the Hunger Dogs finale are many things, but chiefly they are a meditation on time and change. As Apocalypse and Darkseid near victory, they've been robbed of the passions of their pursuit by the growing automation of war. Dead characters are returned as mindless husks, and life is ruled by the algorithm. The critique of the heartbreaking industry of comics is obvious, but the hope Kirby ultimately presents rings more honest. By succumbing to the destruction of their genesis, Highfather inverts the fearful oppression of Darkseid's rule, desperate to exert some form of control. Darkseid seeks out Orion, at last eager for the final confrontation his son has so long sought. But Orion has found love in the pits of Apocalypse, for both a partner and for himself. With the stalemate that has trapped them in a static, vicious cycle finally over, the new gods head out into the unknown, searching for the future. <laughs>